will share. Well, thanks, Tegan, for being here today. We've got teen, teen customer service training. Is that right? Yes, 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 it is. And I'm excited. We were in person while you were all waiting. If you came to this at Pop YS Con, I had a song playing that we will reference in a later slide. But if you happen to know My Chemical Romance and the song Teenagers that will be stuck in your head for the rest of the day, ask poor Chelsea at Master V that came to my program at Pop YS Con and told me it's still stuck in her head. Um, so, uh, let me go to the next slide. So if you don't know me, um, my name is Tegan Beasy. I'm the Youth Services Consultant here at the State Library. Um, these are ways you can contact me. You can give me a call. You can shoot me an email. Um, anything you need, please let me know. Um, or if it's in library talk, you can message me there. Whatever works best for you. So this is the song I was referencing because some people are scared of teenagers and they're not really that scary. You don't have to be afraid of them, I promise. Um, so today we're gonna talk about some general, like working with teenagers. If you have a specific question that, um, because I can't touch on everything here, unfortunately, I, that, I mean, I could do a whole day about teenagers, but I don't know if they're gonna let me get away with that. Um, so there's certain things I might not get to or that you have questions about. Don't hesitate to call me or email me. Um, I'm happy to talk about those with you and discuss different situations, whether it's you wondering about your teen space or how to handle behavior um, or any anything that you want to talk about about teens. I will talk about them forever. They're my favorite, my favorite group. Okay, so how do I know teens? Uh, back in Illinois, I was the teen, I was the young adult librarian for five, uh, no, six, six years. Um, and there is me at a um, superhero party, which was a lot of fun. And I don't know, I mean, the kids had fun, but I think we had a little too much fun doing it too. And also like everybody here, I was a teen. We all remember what it was like. Uh, there's me in the middle. My foot had gone into a hole. This is at Monticello. We went on a two week school trip on a school bus to Virginia and went up and down the East Coast going to Revolutionary War and Civil War sites. So God bless those teachers who willingly stayed with us for two weeks. Um, so we we're all teenagers. It's sometimes it's hard to remember what exactly we felt and what it was like. But I think if you kind of tell yourself like, hey, we've all been there and are not necessarily a bad kid, they might be in a difficult situation. They might be stressed. And there are so many more stressors on teens today than there were growing up. Like social media, I'm so grateful, was not really a big thing until I was in college. So what we're going to talk about is why teens, why do you want them at the library? Why are they important? Um, interacting with teens, the importance of teen spaces, teen programming, and the teen collection, and then social media, how you can use it and what works best for them, and then volunteers and how you can use them as a good part of your library. They, they can come to the library, they can be patrons, but they can also be a part of your library and feel like they're able to contribute. So why teens? First off, 14 million teens are on their own after school. So this could lead to some of them possibly doing their homework, but more than likely not. It could lead to trouble if they don't have somewhere safe to go. Um, maybe they go home and they just take a nap. They do whatever they want to do. They don't get their homework done. Their parents don't get home till late and they have nowhere to kind of go and, and keep up. Um, so if they're on their own, they don't always have that guide that they might need. Um, cause in, in school, you're very structured and then you leave school. And if you don't have structure at home, then what are you going to do and how can you succeed and prepare for the next day? Um, eight in 10 Americans want there to be a safe place for teens. So yay for those eight people, but other two, I don't, I don't know how I feel about them. Uh, but I think it's super important that people acknowledge and know that there needs to be a safe space for teens, not just for younger kids, but all kids deserve a safe space. Um, the prime time for trouble is six, uh, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., so a lot of the time when kids get out of school and before their parents get home. Um, there's nobody watching them. There's nobody kind of observing them and telling them what to do. So this could be theft, drugs, skipping school, any sort of just kind of nefarious, they think, fun activities to get into. Um, four public libraries outnumber McDonald's and Starbucks in the United States. So we can absolutely be a place that teens can go to. Um, there, 
I know we don't have, you know, frappuccinos and fries, but if we provide other services and things for them that they know they can go to and have fun at, and if they make that connection with you, they'll be able to have a, a good place to go. Um, 1.3 billion visits are given to school libraries in any year. Um, so then you are going to expand upon that. Um, they're going to come to you after school because the school library isn't open every day. Uh, so you can be that continuation of what they receive at school and bringing that to them at home. And ages 12 to 18 receive the least financial support. So this means their parents might not be signing them up for sports or like financially be uh having them be in a program that requires money that they might have done when they were younger. Um, a lot of them don't have jobs because they don't have cars or they don't have parents that can afford to get them a car. So then in turn, they can't get a job and then they can't go somewhere else. Um, so it's just kind of a spiral. They're the, the least financially supported. Um, so providing free activities and things for them that they can do will ensure that you come to the, they come to the library. Like I did programs, uh, art programs that uh, when we scheduled them, the adults would pay like $5. I made sure that I covered the whole cost for the teens because they're not going to come if they have to pay even $3 because a lot of the teens don't have money. They don't have something or the $3 they need for something at school versus a library program that I could host for free. So teens are in, you're going to experience teens in all of these developmental stages. Um, so I know, um, so my experience at the teen, as a teen librarian at Lee Villa, um, it, our teen was considered seventh through 12th grade, um, but I know some do fifth through 12th grade, some do sixth. So like early adolescence, you've kind of are getting in there. I mean, they're starting to change. They're definitely becoming more teenagers when they're younger. I know my nieces, when the one turned 11, I was like, oh my gosh, you're a totally different person <laughs> than you are. And you were like two weeks ago. Um, the majority of your teens you're going to get while they're in middle adolescence, 14 to 17. I know how angsty that time was. I know we all do. High school, middle school, it's tough. Um, and then you'll still get kids and in their late adolescence, 18 to 21. Um, and that's an important age to not lose them at as well. Uh, sometimes it's hard when they transition out of youth services, out of teen services into adult. Um, so if you can help in that transitional period, that would keep them coming back to the library as well. Um, you want to keep them coming and you want them to, in the future, bring their family. All right, so interacting with teens. Yes, you have to do it. You can't run away, you can't ignore them. And I know you can do it, I know you can do it. So we're going to take a lesson from the great librarian, Giles from Buffy the Vampire Slayer on how to interact with your teens. So as Giles is showing us right there in the first table, talk to and with them, don't talk at them, don't talk down to them, don't talk to them like they're a small child. Uh, I had a coworker who would talk to them in her like baby voice. I'm like, no, 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 no. They are teenagers. They don't want you to treat them like they're small children. They, they deserve respect and they deserve to be heard and um, to be treated like they are their own person. Um, don't look down on them just like that. Don't just because like, yes, they're younger than you. Yes, they might be in high school, but they're going through tough stuff too, whether it's family stuff, friend stuff, everybody has something, everybody's, everybody's human. Um, and just because you've been there and you've done it already, doesn't mean you can't be supportive for the kids that are going through it right now. Um, give them space. So whether that means a quiet space to read or a place to have an anime club or as well as doing practice magic, I'm not saying light candles at the library and practice magic, but that's what Giles is doing. Um, so give them a space that they need. Even if it's a program where you say, hey, I got all the supplies for this project. You can do it. If you need my help, let me know and just kind of let them do their own thing because then they talk with each other and it's less like class. The more it's like school, the more they don't necessarily want to do that because they're in that all day. And if you can give them something with a little looser structure, it's helpful. And be available. Um, whether that means if they need something, they can shoot you an email, or if you, they come in and they need to talk and there is some, like, you're the only person they feel comfortable with. Uh, for example, I had a trans boy come, on, come in and he said, this is the first place I want to change my name because it's the only place I feel safe. So being that for him was huge and being able to provide that was so important. Um, I had another kid who would come and he would just sit next to me and I'd say, hey, I have to work while you talk, but you can talk to me. And he would sit there for two hours 
um, when we built the new building, my director actually got me a seat that I could put next to me because she knew they would come in and talk to me because I created that safe environment for them and I was available to help them. Um, because a lot of these kids don't necessarily have that outside of the library. All right, teen spaces and why they need them. Sorry, I'm checking my time. Um, all right, so include, if you can, a staff desk or some sort of staff presence if possible. So the only reason I had this desk at this library is because we built a new building. Previously before that, YA was in this teeny tiny little corner, completely separated from where I was, but I still had a presence. I went over and I checked on them. I checked in, I made sure I knew who was over there and what was going on and made sure that they knew I was there if they needed anything. So even if you can't have a desk, if you can have someone like pop out or if you have a laptop and you can take and work out there by them um, and just kind of be like, hey, I'm here, um, then you're going to have a little bit less of issues because they don't feel like they're completely alone and can do whatever they want. And they also will respect that you're allowing them to have their own space um, and you're treating them like an adult, like you trust them, like, hey, I know you can be over here, and but I am here if you need me. Um, I'm a huge proponent of large tables, um, space and surfaces that they can actually utilize. Um, so I don't have a picture on here, unfortunately, um, but in that department, they had these super cute tables, but they were tiny and you could fit maybe a Chromebook on them. So these kids came in, they had Chromebooks, they had textbooks, they had notebooks, they had phones, they had tablets. They don't have, if they want to study as a group, they couldn't all sit at that table. So the majority of the teens, unless they were studying alone, would go study upstairs in the adult space with all the big tables. And then I had people asking me, well, why are the teens studying upstairs? And I said, because we didn't ask them what size tables they want. And I wanted to get large tables, but I wasn't allowed to pick the furniture. Um, so if asking the teens what they want is so important, or at least acknowledging like, hey, we need something that is actually something they can utilize instead of something that just looks cute. Um, technology, even if it's just having an outlet for them to plug into is huge. Uh, so if you have an outlet somewhere, they can charge their phone, they can plug in their computer. Um, if you have a computer they can use while in the library or a tablet of some sort, all the way up to if you have video games, um, just any sort of technology, they are inundated with it. Like they have not known life without technology. Um, so just trying to accommodate that in some way and acknowledge, like, I know even if I don't provide this for you, you're going to be on it while you're here. Um, and even just having those, uh, those outlets or having an extra charger can change uh, the day for a kid. Like I knew a kid who was trying to call his mom to get picked up and he didn't know her cell phone number, which broke my heart. I still have phone numbers memorized from people that I'll never call ever again. Um, but he didn't know her phone number and he couldn't call her on the staff phone to pick him up. So I was like, I got a charger for you so you can charge your phone. Um, so sometimes it will also save you in situations like that, especially if you don't have, um, if they don't have the contact information for someone. All right. And again, if you're not sure about furniture, ask their opinion. So let's say you have an idea of I'm debating between like this size table or this size table or these chairs and these chairs look comfy, but what would they like? Ask them what they want. If you can get a sample of anything, like even a color and say, what, what do you think of this? How do you think this would look? Their feedback is important. They're the ones who are going to be using your space. Um, so you want them to actually want to enjoy it um, and or even a rug, like what color rug, what would tie this together? When I was at Ankeny, um, the uh, Sherry, the teen librarian before me, had had them vote on the rug that was going in the teen room. So that way they had a say of what was in there. And that makes them feel more connected to the space and more like they are a part of the library and they belong there, too. Um, don't ask them and like just completely drop whatever they suggest. Um, if it's something that's not feasible, you can let them know like, hey, I looked into it, but like it's either too expensive or that's just not something we can do right now. But try to do something that let, lets them know they're included because if you ask them and then don't do anything with it, they're not gonna answer your questions anymore and they're not gonna come to programs and they're not gonna have that level of trust with you. Um, don't create a space fully without team feedback. Unfortunately, that's what happened in my last building. Um, and we didn't get 
a lot of team feedback and some of them, like I said, used it, but it wasn't nearly the numbers that we wanted. Um, so having them at least kind of say like, yes, that's a good idea or no, that's a bad idea. Nobody likes that. Or that's super uncool. You don't, that's the last thing you want to be. You don't want to be the uncool librarian. <laughs> Um, have rules for your teen space. Have them not only for your teens, but have them for other aged patrons. Um, so this means, I know it's really hard sometimes if you have a tiny library and your delineation of teen space is a shelf, but you still want the teen space to be like, this is where your safe space is for you to go. And I'm not going to have toddlers crawling all over your stuff so you can't use it. Um, for example, when I had the designated space, um, teens, it was seating and um, seating was priority for grades seven through 12 after school and on weekends and then during like long school breaks. Um, and then anybody during the day could go in and sit down and, and do whatever. And anybody could go in and check out books. Sorry. But seating was specifically for that age group. So that way, like their little sibling, like didn't necessarily if they needed like 10 minutes away, they could go in there and then their kid would, their younger sibling could have something in the kid's area to go do instead. Um, and honestly, you can kind of stop this with furniture. So um, at my, at the building, the old building, we, when we put the teen area together is where the newspapers used to be. Um, so we had some people who would bring the newspapers over from the new newspaper section and sit in the teen area um, on the, <clears throat> the chairs. I'm so sorry. And then they would complain that the kids were over there. <clears throat> so when we built the new building, the chairs we got were not appealing to adults. Teens like them, but adults didn't like them. So that stopped them from camping out in there. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> it's dry. Don't Hawkeye. So pay attention to what's going on, but don't make them feel watched. Don't just like stare at them and constantly like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Show them a level of respect and trust that you know they can be there. I mean, always keep your ear open, especially if anybody's fighting or there's any difficulties with that. <coughs> um, but don't, if, the more you just stare at them and watch them, they're not going to come back because they're not going to feel comfortable. And have fun get to know them when they come in, even if they don't come in that often, ask them about themselves. So like I had this girl who came in and I was helping her find a book. I'd never met her before. And she wound up telling me that she had a math test that day. She came back two months later <coughs> <coughs> and I asked her how her math test was. And she's like, you remember? And that just made that interaction 10 times better. Um, and it made her more confident that she could come back and um, I would remember her. Um, if you can set up a fun project, whether it's a, a quick take and uh, quick take and make or a quick make and take, um, or just something fun that they can do and see, it's you're still putting something out for them. You're putting thought into them, um, and in that same manner, make it a welcoming place. When they come in, say hi. Um, a lot of kids won't say hi if you don't look up from the computer, or if you're let's say you're looking at a um, a journal to the figure out what books you want to buy for your collection. If you don't look up, they're not going to say hi because they don't want to interrupt you and they don't feel comfortable doing that. So sometimes you have to be the first person to make that first move with them. And then they'll be like, oh, okay, they talk to me. Um, as scary as some people think that teens are, they're scared. They're more anxious, I think, about interacting with adults. And sometimes that comes off in a brusque manner or they might be rude because they don't know how to fully express like I'm uncomfortable in this situation. So if you can make it more comfort comfortable for them, more welcoming, the more likely they'll come back. All right, team programming, why you need it. So this book on the left-hand side is a book I contributed to um, about a library program that I did um, in Illinois. And these are large audience programs. So if you're trying to get a large group of kids in, uh, this is a really interesting uh, manual to check out. I highly suggest it. Um, I don't remember if we have a copy at the State Library. If not, I'll ask Scott to get one um, and you can check that out from us. <coughs> so my program in here, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. I did a finals cafe. Um, and this meant that I had like a room sectioned off like a, a 
community room and the kids could come and study for finals. Um, I had snacks for them and I had therapy dogs come in. Dogs that blew it out of the water. Everybody was like, I want the dogs. Even the kids who were like, I'm horribly allergic to dogs, but I have a lint roller would come in and like put their face in the dog. Um, so the first time I did that, we had about 13 kids over three days. I did it again in the fall and we up to about 50 kids a night. And then the next year when I did it, so that spring we had maybe 50, 60. And then when I did it in the fall, the next year, I had over a hundred kids a night. So um, I wound up partnering with businesses in the area for food. They would donate food. Um, the service and the service dogs that came in were free, the therapy dogs. Um, and the school would work with me on helping promote it to them. So they would be studying for finals at school. And then the school librarian would say, hey, we're shutting down, but you can go to the library, the public library. And we actually had kids coming during the day after their finals were done. So I wound up providing lunch for them as well. Um, but I had kids who I'd never met before in my life. And they were shocked that the library had something like this. And I said, yeah, there's so much stuff here that you don't know about. And they really do tell each other stuff. If there's something interesting that they've been to, they tell each other. So um, don't think that they don't talk. <laughs> um, they're probably your best word of mouth. Um, so you are going to have a various program age range. Um, again, this is just kind of saying sixth grade for middle school. You might have fifth grade. You might have even down to fourth grade. I know it's a little bit different everywhere. Um, but middle school generally is like sixth through eighth grade. Um, high school, nine to 12 and all teens, just six to 12. Um, so I had a majority, like I would do some all ages programs, but then for example, like book clubs, I had a middle school book club and I had a high school book club because my, as much as it put more work on me, I didn't feel comfortable having uh, 12 year olds who maybe weren't ready to read a certain book that like an 18 year old was comfortable reading. Um, so I tried to make it as much as their own, uh, their own type of program as possible. Um, I also did some crossover programming with like the fourth and fifth graders into middle school. So that's a great way to get those kids kind of more adjusted and comfortable going to teen programs. Um, I did, I did all teen programs, all ages. They went well. Um, interactive movies tend to be really good for that. Um, it's really funny because they do kind of section themselves off. Like all the high schoolers would sit in one space and all the middle schoolers would sit somewhere else, but they all had fun together. Um, so you can, you can break them down. You could make them even smaller if you wanted. Like I, like finals cafe was only for high school. Um, and I did some college essay writing classes that was only for high school. Um, but then I would try to have, so if I had a high school program that month, I would try to have a middle school program and then have one all age program. Um, I know it's not always feasible and it was a lot of me just doing it by myself. I made myself crazy, but um, I wanted them all to feel like they had a space and something for them to go to. So here's just some programming suggestions. By all means, come up with whatever you want. If you have any questions about any of these, don't hesitate to email me, call me, whatever. Um, and these are really kind of you can switch them to different age groups, um, but these are just some of the age groups that I did these with. Um, so middle school, I had a monthly book club because they, while they're, they're getting busier, they weren't necessarily as busy as high schoolers. Um, so they had time to say, read a book once a month and come to book club. Um, we did a video game night that I didn't intend to be middle school only, but only middle schoolers showed up. Um, so then it kind of worked in the future. I did two different um, aged game nights and I had high schoolers who were coming to the high school, one in middle school that was coming to the middle school. Um, they also learned that if you play Mario Kart with me, I won't let you win even if you're just a kid because I am very, very competitive. Uh, Emily also learned that at our game night at Pop YS Con. Emily, our um, uh, here at the State Library, I'll have to ask her about that. Um, cake decorating, we actually got the cakes de uh, donated from Walmart. They have these little like seven inch cakes um, and they donated them. So ask your Walmart, it can't hurt. Even if they can't donate a direct item, um, I talked to somebody that their Walmart donates them a gift card that they use to purchase things from there for their programs. So it can't hurt to see. Um, and then we just bought frosting and showed like we had a book that had different decorating techniques and they got to decorate their cakes and take it home and eat it. Um, DIY spa. Um, we had this suggested for a summer reading prize and it wound up being wildly popular. So we're like, let's do a program. Um, this involves 
getting like just essential oils and putting them in it, like some like plain lotion and mixing that in kind of just like making your own relaxing spa items. Um, and it's fun because it's something that they can actually take home and say like, Hey, I did this. Um, high school finals cafe that I talked about before, huge, loved it. And we actually found a way to do it in COVID when they couldn't be in the building, we made finals kits to go. Um, and it had a coupon for a restaurant in town. It had a ramen in it, um, some candy and like study tips, something like that. And they could register. And then they got up, a got a box and got to take that home. Um, for high school, I did a quarterly book and movie club. So I bribed them because high schoolers are super busy. I swear at the second they like go from eighth to ninth grade, it's just like, I have you and now you're gone. Um, so I know it's hard to get them in. So like I said, bribery is okay. Um, what I did is I would buy the books and I'd buy it in paperback. So that way it's more affordable. And we only did it quarterly. So it didn't take a huge part of my budget. Um, and then I would buy the books and they would get a copy of the book to keep and they'd come to the program and then we would watch the movie that was either connected to or based on the book. And then we would have a discussion and compare and contrast, see what we liked the most, what we didn't like. Um, and the, I had one, I did five feet apart and I think I had the most kids at that one. And my joke was eight out of those like 15 kids cried. And that must be a good, a good thing because the movie made them cry. So I felt really bad when their parents came to pick them up. I'm like, I promise it was just the movie. <laughs> Um, library, ooh, oh, I skipped a uh, college essay writing workshop. So I did this that we made it so freshmen through seniors could come. Anybody could come. Um, I mostly got juniors, some sophomores, and I have my MFA in writing for children, and young adults. And one of my coworkers had her MFA in English. So we hosted the writing workshop. Um, and some of the kids don't necessarily have a teacher or someone at school who can look at their essays. Um, so I said, I am happy to do that for you. And even if I had to do it on my own time and not at work, like I would do that. Um, so they came and they did the workshop. I had a few of the girls keep emailing me and I worked with them and helped them. Um, and they appreciated that because that was something that they couldn't get at school. Um, and then library buddies, I love this program. So it's something that you would do with three to five-year-olds and then your high schoolers. Um, so we did an art one, uh, you can change it there. You can do cooking, you can do travel, you can do all kinds of things, but art is pretty easy. So each, uh, you would have about 10 kids from each age group. So 10, three to five year olds and 10, uh, high schoolers, and you would pair them up and then they would come for a month, one, uh, one day a week for a month. And we would have a different artist to talk about. So like one week was Picasso. So we talked about Picasso. We read a picture book that involved Picasso. We hung up pictures of his work around the room. And then the older kids would take the little kids around and say, hey, like, what colors do you see in this picture? How does this make you feel? Um, what shapes do you see? Uh, and then they could interact and then they would do a project based on that artist together. Um, some of those kids got babysitting jobs out of it. Um, they really bonded with the younger kids. It made the younger kids more comfortable um, talking with older kids. It made the older kids feel comfortable talking with little ones. Uh, and they got volunteer hours for it. Um, we'll talk about volunteers more later. Uh, but I know if you tell them, hey, you get hours, they will they will come running. <laughs> um, some great things for all teens, interactive movies. If you don't want to know what an interactive movie is, I will briefly tell you. So that way, you know, um, you, so the first one I did was the first Harry Potter movie and the script is available on teen services underground. I'm pretty sure is where it was posted. If you just Google Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone interactive movie, you'll be able to find it. Um, and there's a script and there'll have like a, a scene. So for that one in the beginning, it says Hagrid cries. Uh, there's a little box next to it that says the action that they have to take. So Hagrid cries, take out your tissue and wave it around. So you give them a bag or a box full of stuff that they need for the movie. Um, and there's some points where it says a scene and then it says, get ready. And that's when you get to do something to them, whether it means spraying them with silly string or throwing things or just something surprising happening. It's a ton of fun. Um, we wound up writing our own scripts for the second and third Harry Potter movie. Um, we wrote our own script for the second Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, we wrote one for Hocus Pocus. So like once you get into it, you can really find um, a lot of fun ones. Our most popular one, though, was Elf. 
Uh, and we actually did have spaghetti that didn't have sauce on it. And we provided them um, little things of syrup that McDonald's donated to us and they tried it. Oh, bless their hearts. Um, so it's fun. It's great. And then you can age a lot of these down to like the elf one. We could have definitely done with a younger crowd and parents. Like it could have been more of a family one. Um, but the teens loved having this. That was just theirs. So um, back to school locker decorations. Most middle schools and high schools, they have lockers. I know some kids don't use their lockers quite as much as they used to because all their books are are on are all digital, which is crazy. Um, but that's kind of a fun back to school thing that you could do for all ages if you're trying to get all the ages in the library. Um, take and makes, I think those will continue to be huge regardless of if we're curbside or not. Um, that reaches kids that maybe don't have time to come into the library, like your high schoolers that are super busy. They're in sports, they're in youth group, uh, they're playing an instrument, they're in drama, and they have no time. Um, so that you, if you provide take and makes for them to swing by and pick up, that way they can still be involved and connect with you at the library. Um, writing club is also really um, a great way to kind of get them talking to each other and brainstorming and coming up with different ideas. Um, I think a lot of people feel like they're the only ones who like, like maybe a certain, a certain TV show. Like for example, I'm a huge Buffy fan and I wrote tons of Buffy fan fiction in seventh grade. Yes, I did. Um, and I thought it was just me, but had I known that there is a, there are other people who love this, um, it would have been a great connection and a great way to meet each other. Uh, so writing club is a great one too. All right. Teen young adult collection. That's me before I moved in front of her YA collection. So I, I think, hold on, let me see if I'm gonna talk about it. No, okay. So when I took it over, sorry, um, I basically had to do a huge overhaul. I had to weed, I had to make sure we had books that weren't purchased in there. Um, the person who did it before me very much let their personal opinions get in the way of collection development, which is something we're all, I'm, we all have preferences. We all have things that we tend to go towards. Like I tend to get fantasy and historical fiction and I have to check myself and I have to say, how much realistic fiction did you get in there? How much sci-fi? Um, so it's something that we all have to do. Um, so I, I weeded it heavily. I got rid of old copies of books that were falling apart and have new covers. New covers can revamp your, your collection. Like you might not be able to do it for all of them, but if you have a popular, popular series that's falling apart or an old series that maybe you don't see circulate as much, if they have new covers, bring those in. So uh, an example for mine was the Lux series by Anna Goodberson. His historical fiction. And when it came out, it was when like the big ball gowns and everything were super popular on books. And that's not so much the thing anymore. So I replaced all of those with the new covers that are just like fun illustrated covers. And they search like crazy because books date themselves as much as we're supposed to say, don't judge a book by its cover. I mean, I know I do it. If I go somewhere like that cover does not look appealing. Maybe I'm not going to pick it up. Um, so getting to know your collection really well is super important, um, and asking the kids what they like to read. So I'll get to that with volunteers. So why do you need a teen slash Y8 collection? So, uh, 50% is the amount of more words that are in books than they teach children in any primetime television. So yes, they might be watching educational shows or something on TV, but they're not getting the vocabulary that they might need to get from reading. Um, 48% is the amount of audiobook listeners under age 35. Um, kids, it's so much easier for them to listen to an audiobook now. They've got their phone. Um, they might have on a tablet or something, or they can listen on their computer, but it's not the day of tape decks and CD players anymore. It's everything is right there. Um, and then if you have playaways, that's huge too. They can just plug their headphones in, have that AAA battery, and they're gone. Um, my audiobook stats were through the roof for the digital copies. My CDs, not so much. Um, <clears throat> six minutes is the amount of time needed to help increase the chances of a reader passing their benchmark. So this is huge, especially in summer reading. Um, everybody knows about the summer slump. If you can encourage your teens to read six minutes more a day, that will help them um, because they're getting that extra time. They're getting the extra stimulation. They're getting the extra words. 
Um, and then this number broke my heart. 1.2 million is the amount of teams that drop out with a low literacy rate. Um, so you, even if they do drop out, you want to be somewhere that they can come and they can continue to educate themselves and can continue to read and move forward. You want to be that welcoming place. So how do you promote your YA collection, especially if you don't necessarily have a team space? Um, I know it can be really hard. Um, if you can do a display, displays are huge, even if it's just like it doesn't have to necessarily be something for that month. So sometimes I would do monthly displays um, as, about something specific that month. Other times I would try to do funny ones. So for a while, the trend in YA um, was to have a person on the cover with their head. Like you couldn't actually see their head. You just saw like their mouth down. Um, so it said, where's your head at? And I just found a bunch of covers where you couldn't see people's faces or their head was chopped off and it was just their torsos. Um, any kind of just something to catch their attention. Um, if even if you have new books, if you can just situate a few of them in a new like in a new manner, so that way they can see them, the the shininess of the cover is going to catch their attention. I remember a little girl coming into the library going, "It's so shiny!" over a book cover, and I'm like, "Yep, yep that's crow brain right there." I I feel you. Um, Displays are great if you can do them. I know it's not always feasible. Um, book talks, super important. If you can get into your schools and do book talks there, that's great. I've also recorded book talks and sent them to librarians and English teachers. So that way they could show them um, on a certain day. Uh, I would go into the middle schools and go to English classrooms or do it in the library. Um, at the high school, I would go sit in the library because the kids would come in there during their lunch period and I would talk with them there. It was a lot harder to get into the English classes in high school just because the teachers are so busy. Um, but book talks are super important and just kind of, even if you don't know a book super well, kind of have an idea of how you know, like I would know enough about the book to tell the kid, like tell the kid you're going to like this, but I haven't read it, but I know based on this is the theme you like sci-fi and this has this many rating, like just to kind of, you don't want to not show them a book just because maybe you haven't read the whole thing, but you've read about it. Um, social media, you can definitely share books on there. Kids, we're going to talk about social media, um, but they will see stuff on Instagram. They'll see stuff on TikTok. Um, you can share things on there. You can share uh, what I used to make was we would do like mood boards and cause that's a big thing. Um, so we would do like, I did a dark academia mood board and it had dark academia YA books on it. Um, and you could do that and then like put different tags in and then they can see that. And they can, I would say like all these books are currently available to check out at the library. Um, some catalogs have carousels on the front page that show new books. Um, and sometimes like you can change what collection it shows. So we had it so there like it would show the new adult, um, new kids and new teen. Um, and that's huge because like they're right there looking for another book and that cover might catch their attention. Um, book lists. I used to make these into bookmarks and I would have them in the teen space. So I would take different genres, historical fiction, horror, sci-fi, fantasy, any very Wow, I just lost my train of thought. Um, the very different genres and um, on both sides, I would have suggestions of titles. I made sure we had the title in our collection. Um, so that's something that I would have to go back and redo um, every like year, year and a half um, to just kind of, I would go back and check and I would say, hey, do I still have all of these? Did something get weeded? Do I need to add something else? Um, but those were great readers advisory, just hand them out. Um, half the time they would say, I want this type of book. I would give them a suggestion. I would take the bookmark. I'd stick it in the book and I'd be like, take this with you. Um, staff recommendations are huge too. If you can tell them like, Hey, I really like this book. They really like knowing that it's something good, that it's going to be something that they want to read. Um, and they like being able to connect with you too. Um, I had a girl who we were reading the red queen trilogy, uh, no, four books, the Red Queen series together. And she got ahead of me and oh my gosh, she would come in and she was like, have you read it yet? Um, but it made this great connection with her and it was able to um, really extend my relationship. So staff recommendations are always fun too. Or if you can put like talkers on the bookshelf underneath something, that's always fun. Okay, YA book awards. Um, so there's the Michael L. Prince Award which is for any book published in that year. 
Um, can be fiction, can be nonfiction, can be a graphic novel, as long as it's published for teens. Um, the Odyssey Award is um, a audiobook award because of Odysseus and um, his spoken tale. Um, this one's really great. And then the William C. Morris is the YA Debut Award. Um, so just that uh, Morris and the Prince have a winner overall, and then they have a um, like honor titles. So those are other ones that are great suggestions. Um, sometimes the Morris also wins the Prince in the same year. Um, it just, it depends. Sometimes you'll pick up a book and it's got all the, the seals on them. Um, but these are always great go-tos to give ideas for kids for what they should read. Um, definitely ones that you would want to buy if you're looking to buy new ones for your collection. Like keep an eye out for the Youth Media Awards every year and say, hey, like these are the top books. Let's make sure we have those. All right. Social media. As we were saying earlier, teens are inundated with technology. Like that is what they know. They live on the internet. Um, Facebook, I'm sorry, is for, as they all like to tell me, old people. So yes, I'm sharing things on there, but I'm expecting their parents to see it on there, not the teens. So when I would share stuff on Facebook, I would gear it toward more towards parents. I would say like, Hey, do you know a teen that would be interested in this Twitter? They, um, and YouTube, they might be more likely to follow you on. Maybe those aren't the big teen spots unless they happen to have a podcast or, um, are a gamer Instagram and TikTok. Those are where it's at. I know TikTok is terrifying. I still can't figure it out. And also it takes so long to make those videos. Everybody who has a like thriving TikTok channel, I'm amazed. Um, but Instagram and TikTok, that's where they are. Um, if you can find a way to get them to follow you, like for summer reading, I gave them a bonus raffle ticket if they followed us on Instagram. Like I said, I will bribe them. That's fine. Um, or if they followed us on Instagram. And if you can find a way to share with them on there, like, hey, this is an upcoming program, you can share a picture of what it is. Um, we try to do TikToks of like just different uh, books that we found on the shelves. You can kind of do a whole lot with that. Um, so social media, you can definitely do um, collection uh, promotion on there as well. Okay. And last, volunteers. So why would a teen volunteer at the library? Well, one, school credit. Um, so I know out here it's called the Silver Cord. Back in Illinois, it was National Honor Society. So they need an X amount of volunteer hours each year to qualify for the Silver Cord or to be in NHS. Um, the library is often one of the first places they think of. Um, so having actual things for them to do is great. Uh, for example, when I took over the YA stuff, um, the only thing that we had for them to do at that point was um, clean board books, which we will get to the bottom there. Uh, but let me tell you, they hated me. Um, they, it's fine if you clean board books for a little bit, but for your whole shift, it's miserable. Um, but school credit, they might come in for that. They might want to build a resume for college. Um, they might want to add something on their college applications. Maybe they've never done volunteer work before and they need something to pad their application with. Um, and they love the library. They've been coming there since they were little. Uh, it's the place that they feel the most comfortable. So you're going to have kids who deeply connect with the library and want to help be a part of it. Um, what can you have them do? It really depends. Um, so sometimes we use them for program prep. So for example, we did this crazy um, thing for summer reading that it was a box, like a little box filled with different wooden parts um, and kids could take it and build whatever they wanted out of it. But that involved someone in the back counting out 25 popsicle sticks, this many of this, this many of that, and putting them in the boxes. That was great for them to do. Um, and especially because it was at the end of the school year, kind of into summer before summer reading really started and they needed stuff to do. Um, they can help prepare things for your programs for younger kids. They can even be volunteers to help at your programs for younger kids. Um, they can either kind of help keep an eye on what's going on, help clean up. Uh, that's always really, really helpful. Um, cleaning board books, like I said, my big suggestion though, if you do have them do this, have them wear gloves because the wipes will eventually hurt their hands. Um, so, but it's really nice to know that at least at some point the books are getting cleaned because I know and babies are going to put their mouths on everything. It's just the way it is. But it's just nice to know at one point, these have been wiped down. Um, another thing I used to do was advanced reader copy reviews. 
So um, there's multiple ways you can get advanced reader copies. Um, if you buy through Baker and Taylor, you can actually write to your, um, your vendor through them and say, I would like to get on the list for uh, young adult ARC boxes. And I think they send them like three to four times a year, and it'll be a box full of advanced reader copies of books that are coming out. Um, they want you to look at it so that way you buy them. Uh, what I did is I would have the kids come in, they could pick a copy and then they would read it. And then they would write a review for me and tell me, um, is this a pro like what age group is this appropriate for? Is it middle school? Is it just high school? Um, are there any, is there anything in there that might upset someone like trigger warnings, content warnings? Um, cause unfortunately I can't read everything as much as I'd like to. And they would tell me this is a good book or this is a bad book because they're the one who's ultimately reading these books. So you want to make sure they're actually going to enjoy it. Um, so I gave them an hour of volunteering per every hundred pages, and then they wrote me a review. Um, it was great. I had some who were super into it. They wrote me the best reviews. I feel like I read the books without even having to read them. Um, and it worked for kids who were super involved in other things and maybe needed volunteer hours, but didn't have time in their schedule to physically be at the library for a few hours. And they could do this at home. Um, so this was when I was at Papoyesk and I was asking if anybody has any questions, but we can ask right now if anybody has any questions while we're in here, or if there's anything specific that you were hoping to um, talk about. Like I said, if we don't talk about it here, um, please email me, give me a call. I'm more than happy to talk about anything. And I just realized there is a martini glass on this slide and it was a birthday slide. <laughs> I swear I'm not giving martinis to teenagers. Not a martini. It's like, um, what were those things really popular at the um, World Cup in South Africa a few years ago? Oh, that big when, tall. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Okay. Regardless. <laughs> um, someone did ask about the updating covers. So you mentioned if something's not circling, but it's still really good content. Is there a way to update the covers without buying the whole book new, or did you just trash the book and purchase? Yeah, I just bought, I just bought the, like, so I knew I couldn't do it with every series I wanted, obviously, but there were ones that um, books like it would circulate. And I was like, I think this one would circulate if it looked newer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's worth trying at least like you could start with a, a handful and just see like, Hey, does this change my circ stance? Um, and then, yeah, so like I had a budget set aside for replacements when I took over because it, it hadn't been weeded, stuff hadn't been replaced for years. Um, so I probably did a little more than I normally averagely, average would averagely do. Um, so yeah, unfortunately there was no, I didn't have a way that I could just like paste a new cover on. I wish I could do that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> trying to think how you would do that contact paper with like printed contact paper or something yeah I don't know we had to do that with some um, DVDs when the oh like, sure things tore so then we would just copy it from another one and stick it inside the thing we're like you oh don't yeah know. <laughs> um there's a question as well are there other ways to get arcs besides Baker and Taylor or is that the main one that you know of so um physical arcs I mostly use Baker and Taylor um, I also go, I attend as many of the collection development webinars that I can, like I'll get them from book list. I'll get them from uh, a bunch of different. So like book list is a huge one. Um, sometimes Macmillan will host one on their own, but if you can go to a webinar, oftentimes the people presenting the titles will say, Hey, if you want a physical copy of these, shoot me an email and they'll just send them to you. Um, and like, they didn't care if I asked for 10, they sent me 10. Um, you can also get digital uh, copies from either NetGalley or Edelweiss. These are both, um, you can create free accounts and you put yourself on there as a librarian. Um, and then you can see what's coming out and they'll have review copies on there. Um, so kids could feasibly make their own account on there and say like, I'm a reviewer. Um, and they could request copies of those and they could read them on a Kindle or an iPad or something like that. And then if you go to a conference ever, grab ARCs if you can. I, oh, it's bad when I go to conferences. It's real bad. I had to mail my ARCs home. My husband was like, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. I'm like, I can't fly with this many on the plane. Um, so I would get as many as I could. So that way I would have those for the kids when they came in and volunteered. But I know that's not always an option. Um, but if you ever get the chance, definitely snag those. 
You're muted, Sam. The question from uh, Tate in chat says, um, just kind of trying to navigate that teens using the space for mm -hmm. their own, what, what they're doing, and that's great, you want them there. Uh, they're playing video games in this case. How do you not be the annoying librarian who's like, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? So uh, <laughs> this question from Tate specifically says, any ideas for conversation starters? Ooh, sure. So um, let's see. So if they like, if they're playing video games, like, do they have, I'm curious, do you have, do they have to wear headphones when they play or do you have it so where they're just open? Because sometimes it's harder when they've got headphones on. You can't necessarily get their attention. Um, but if they're doing something like we had board games too, and they might be playing something, I'd go over and I would say like, Hey, what you doing? Or, um, I've never played this before. What are you doing? Or, um, like one time there was a group of boys playing, um, in a major league baseball game and they were playing the Cubs and somebody else. And I'm a white Sox fan. So I went over and I was like, you picked the wrong Chicago team. And then it just kind of started a conversation. So in, instead of always being like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Try to, I know it's hard like you, like to just find a way to segue in, but if you can kind of relate to them in that manner, um, I think that's always huge. Yeah. If you can work out a time, I have a feeling too, just like if it's, if it's your cup of tea, grab a sauce, grab a controller, Yep. yep. Um, have them teach you play a couple rounds of whatever yep. if you can, and then uh, kind of let them go on their way. Uh, and then explain to your boss later why you were playing video games on the job. <laughs> yeah, the day we had that video game and we were playing Mario Kart and they were yeah. asking me, they're like, why are you so good at this? I'm like, listen, I grew up with Mario Kart, kid. I know Rainbow Road. <laughs> I know Mario Kart, but only like certain varieties of it, I'm afraid. Um, I liked what you were saying at the beginning too, and it kind of got me thinking that uh, about kind of this mix of like, yeah, the teens in playing video games or just hanging out. Uh, what is, what did, what's the old one hanging out, messing around, geeking out, oh. you know, this, that, oh. I don't know. It's like this whole hanging out. Uh, I can't <laughs> I remember the whole thing. Know. Someone help me out in the chat. Um, but, uh, but also like they do kind of, in some cases need that academic space too. Yes. Yep. to get homework done, to do group projects. So, you know, that's another piece of the space part that you do have to navigate and also a nice way if you can configure like your library to have some multi-purpose space. So in the morning, this space really is used by the old people reading the newspapers, but in the afternoon, we do kind of let the teens use it, uh, you know, for group projects or something, but we had trying a to- A programming room we would do that with. Um, oh, yeah. Like before, so in the new building, we had gotten- study rooms for the teens, which was amazing. And that's not something that is normal by any means. Um, but in the old building, like the study rooms, we only had three of them. They'd be full from people there all day. So I would go to check to see if any of our like bigger community rooms were being used. And if they weren't, I would just set up some tables and say, hey, you guys can work out, like you can work in here, you can talk. Um, it kind of gives you your own space. And I would just kind of go in and out and check on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you do want to have them, um, yeah, you do want to have kind of all those spaces available if you yes. can. I also kind of like what you said about it's not truly their own space necessarily. It's kind of the illusion of them having their own <laughs> space. So even if there's a couch or a table or a bookshelf dividing them from the little kids, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of saying like, oh, this is big, big kid zone. This is little kid zone. It's like when you go to the grocery store and you switch aisles, like suddenly you're in the dairy, like, okay, yes. it's just this line delineating that I'm in dairy. Um, right. So it's, yeah, it just gives them that sense of this is specifically for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, someone says, and I think this is probably something that's worth addressing in our last few minutes here. How do you defend what you're doing in your library against the community members who just say, well, you guys are just kind of like babysitting these teens. Oh, yeah. We shouldn't have this space here because the teens, you know, they're just hanging out. They're not doing anything productive. You're just babysitting them. How do, can you kind of go back over some of the, you brought that up at the beginning, but kind of hit yeah, some so, of those high points for me again. Yeah. A lot of those, um, like the stats that I gave you would be things that I would tell them about. Um, like, uh, that I forget, I can't even remember the percentage, but of how many kids, um, don't have somewhere to go after school, um, just explaining why 
having a place for them after school is good because I'm like, well, you don't want them to get in trouble out at the store. You don't want to see them in at the park alone. You don't want them to be messing around. Like they need some safe space to go. Um, and I, then I would argue and say, Hey, if you think they're just sitting, they're just sitting here doing nothing. Well, then I'm going to do a teen program and the kids who are sitting here are going to come in and say, Oh, I have something to do. Um, but we need to get them in the door first. So even if that's what you have to do first is just create a space. And then when they see what you're doing for them, it'll change their minds. Like I had a, a dad who kind of felt that way. He was like, I don't know why you're building a new building. I don't know why there has to be a teen space. And then he saw all the kids that came to Finals Cafe and he's like, oh, I get it. Um, so sometimes if you can even just show them and or say like, hey, I had this many kids at a program the other night. That's why we have this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Tegan. Oh, We're coming. We got a couple minutes left if anybody does have them. any additional questions. I but, just uh, you can do it. You've got this. Yes. I believe in you. It does feel like that sometimes going into a teen program. <laughs> Just put your war paint on and, and yell really loud. Sometimes. <laughs> or is it, is it freedom? That's the line from that movie, right? Does he just yell? <laughs> The other thing, you know, I do want to encourage folks in too, of course, and everyone knows this is that, you know, two teens is a teen program. One yes. teen is a teen program. And yes. like Tegan said, uh, you know, you went from how many to how many with that ongoing finals cafe series started at 13. And then the next time went up to 50 and then went over to a hundred. And yeah. that was over a course of three years. So don't so give even up. Even 13 is a lot of teens for some of our libraries here in yeah. Iowa. But I mean, the, the scale there is what I want to point out that Absolutely. you were at a bigger and library I, system. And, and I had programs where I'd only have one or two kids come. But guess what? We would do it. Um, like I had a poet come one day uh, to do poetry. And it was the first beautiful day in spring. And it was a Sunday. So nobody came except this one girl. So then I sat and did the program with her, with the poet. So that way she didn't feel like we're all just staring at her. So if you can find a way to make them comfortable, um, don't cancel the program if you don't have to, because for someone, it's going to make a difference. Exactly. I think that's good advice for sure. Well, thank you very much, Tegan. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, do go out and conquer teen services. Ah, signage advice. And maybe this is something we'll have to take offline. Oh, there's a question that just came into the chat. Uh -huh. um, signage advice for teen space versus kid space. Okay. So just like, you, are you talking about like, just so you know, like this is the teen area versus this is the, the kids mm -hmm. area. Yeah. Does anyone have signage that reads in a kind way that tells younger kids, this is a this space is for teens. So my, I just had something hanging up that said this space and like after school and on weekends is used for grades seven to whatever. Um, so it wasn't like you can't be here, um, but it was just saying like seating is for them. And that way, if I said to someone, hey, like right now, this is for middle school and high schoolers. And they would say, who says that? And then you're like right there on the sign. <laughs> this is right there. Um, and I know libraries that do that for like kids spaces and stuff, too. So that way adults don't take over the little kid space. Um, but I just tried to make it a general statement and less like a, um, like you must follow, like you want them to follow it, but you don't want it to be mean. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Tegan. Thank you everyone for coming today. Have a good rest of your day. Um, we will be sure to send these slides out as well as, um, an invitation to complete the survey as well. So thanks everyone. Thank you.